detention and uh, let's get get started. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody for braving the cold temperatures and slippery roads to uh, be here today. Um, it's, uh, my name is Dana Sosi. I represent Jobs Ohio. If you're not familiar with Jobs Ohio, uh, we are the state's uh, private, not-for-profit uh, corporation uh, that focuses on economic development, attracting uh, and retaining and expanding our uh, 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 employer base in, in the state of Ohio. Today we brought together a diverse uh, and accomplished group of individuals that all have something important in common. Um, one is an understanding uh, of the benefits of our existing nuclear energy plants and the urgent need to preserve them around the country. Um, so I'm joined with uh, Senator Judd Gregg, who has a long and distinguished career in public service. He represented New Hampshire as governor and has served in both the U.S. Senate and House of Representatives. Seated next to him is uh, Carol Browner, former climate czar with the Obama White House, who previously served as administrator of the U.S. EPA for eight years under President Clinton. Also joined with Larry Cherney, who has over 35 years working in electric utilities here in Ohio and also serves as business manager for IBEW Local 245. And then lastly, we have Jim Lash, who began his career in the US Navy, uh, serving aboard multiple nuclear powered ships and he's currently president of uh, Generation for First Energy. So I'll turn it over to Senator Gregg. Would Thank you like you, to Dana. get us started? Sure, thanks. And it's great to be here. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be here in Ohio, home of the Ohio State football team, which I was cheering for, even though I'm from New Hampshire. We don't have football in New Hampshire, so I had to pick somebody, you know? So I went to Ohio State. Um, it's uh, also great to be on this panel, and especially to be here with Carol Browner, who's such a, a force and has been for so many years in the area of environmental protection. I want to tell you a little bit about Nuclear Matters, what we're up, up to and why, why we got organized, and then give you a little few thoughts on part of the question that we're going to address today and then move down the panel for other parts of the question. Nuclear Matters was put together by uh, Evan By and myself and a group of folks who helped out considerably uh, to ad address what we considered as former members of the Senate and as former governors to be a key issue of public policy which is that our nuclear plants in this country, and we're talking now about our existing nuclear plants, some of them are under significant stress and the ability to continue to operate is in question, even though they have a considerable amount of useful life left. In other words, there is a possibility that some of them may be turned off before their useful life is completed, which makes no sense in our opinion. It makes no sense for lots of reasons. Uh, nuclear power has a unique, some unique advantages that it brings to the issue of of how we deliver energy in this country. It represents about 20% of the energy produced in this country. It represents, as Carol will talk about, about 64% of the carbon-free energy produced in this country. Uh, it is a power source that is reliable in the sense that it runs 24-7 and produces 90% of the time, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second. Uh, and it brings significant diversity into the power pool and the power mix. Uh, obviously, with the rise of natural gas, which we s certainly support, and in fact, we support all forms of energy production, whether it's renewables, natural gas, whatever, uh, there has been a movement towards natural gas. But what we must be careful about, and what our view is as nuclear matters, is that we not end up being a nation that puts all our eggs in one basket. You wouldn't, if you were investing in, a st in stocks, put all your money in one stock, and you shouldn't put all your energy reliability into one energy source. And nuclear power is there, it exists, and, it should, and we should take advantage of it. The problem is that these plants, and there are about 10 of them that represent about 20 reactors, have sort of been hit by a perfect storm. First is a flat energy supply, uh, energy demand, I'm sorry, uh, not supply. Uh, second is the issue of the fact that they don't get credit in their calculation of what they should get for the cost of their energy. They don't get credit for the fact that they're carbon free. They don't get credit for the fact that they're, they've got this huge reliability capability. Uh, and, and, and also tied to the fact that even though, because they produce energy 24-7, they're not able, because of our antiquated transmission systems, to often move their energy around the way they might be able to to take advantage of, 
of the production that they're doing. So this is combined to put these 10 plants at risk. And, and regrettably, uh, two of them have been turned off before they should have been turned off, in our opinion, uh, taken out of the energy mix. Uh, one is in my part of the country, Vermont Yankee. And, I, and we now have very real time uh, examples of what happens when this occurs. For example, Vermont Yankee, all of the energy is produced and it represents energy production, which means that if it's not online, you're gonna, you could add, an, it'll add like 1.4 million new cars to the road. But all of that energy production will be replaced by carbon emission, emitting energy. Uh, so you're taking offline and non-carbon emitting source and putting online carbon emitting sources. Spot, it'll have to be spot purchased in New England. So the cost in southwestern New Hampshire will jump by about 50%. That's the projection. Uh, that's not a good outcome in our opinion. So we're very interested in initiating this conversation. And we're not proposing specific outcomes or specific uh, actions. We're just trying to raise the visibility of the issue of nuclear power and it's important in the energy mix. Because the average American, when they go in their room, when they go home and they turn on the light switch and lights come on, they don't think about where the energy comes from. It's when it doesn't come on that they think about it, and then it's too late. And the problem is if we don't maintain our energy, our nuclear fleet, it will be too late. Someday somebody will come into their home uh, and the lights won't go on. On the issue of reliability, which is a specific area I want to talk about, nuclear energy, as you folks probably know, runs 24-7. It's 90% online and even higher. And we have some pretty real world examples of how important that is. The last polar vortex, for example, it was nuclear power that carried large regions of this country through that issue when there was so much demand. Weather related events, which put huge demands on the base load, it's nuclear power that's there to take that demand on and be able to be sure that we meet it. And so this reliability factor, we think we sh these nuclear plants should get credit for. So that's the purpose of nuclear matter, to significantly raise the public discussion around the importance of already existing plants, we're not talking about new plants, and especially those plants that might be at risk. And one of the key persons who's been carrying this message and talking about this has been my friend Carol Browner, uh, who has such an ex exemplary track record in addressing environmental protection in this country. Carol. Uh, thank you, Senator, and it's a, a real pleasure to get to, to work with you and, and uh, Senator Bayh on this issue. Um, and thank you all for joining us uh, here today uh, for this conversation. Um, I thought I might just start with why I'm pro nukes. Um, I think a lot of people here, you know, she ran the EPA, she's an environmentalist, a lifelong environmentalist, don't they oppose nuclear energy? And I'll be honest with you, I did at one point in my career. I sort of, you know, through my island, it's just what, you know, you were supposed to think. And about more than a decade ago, I was uh, doing some work with a, a group of thought leaders on um, global energy security. And in the process of it, started uh, thinking about uh, my, my concern around global climate change. And in the course of writing this piece, I changed my position on nuclear power. Uh, because I came to think, how could I believe that climate change is, I believe it's the greatest threat we face in the world uh, today. And how could I have that belief and then take a source of carbon-free energy off the table, that it just really wasn't a consistent way of thinking. And so uh, changed my position and, and since that time have you know, advocated for the important role that existing nuclear can play uh, in helping uh, maintain our, our or in helping us meet carbon standards and helping us uh, make sure that we don't contribute, continue to emit carbon pollution and contribute to um, global warming. One of the things that the, the senator mentioned that I just want to go back to for a second that's really important, uh, we get about 20% of our base load power today in the United States uh, from nuclear, from a carbon-free energy source. If we were to lose that, you know, at the very time we're trying as a country to reduce our carbon emissions, you know, we would dig the hole even deeper. We would make the challenge of reducing greenhouse gas pollution uh, even harder. And so as we begin the work, and the president has been leading the way, of trying to uh, reduce our carbon emissions, it doesn't make any sense to take this source um, off uh, the table. It's a very important source. It's an important source uh, here in um, Ohio where I'm going to get the statistic wrong. It's probably up there. 90% of your... Um, carbon-free electricity uh, comes from uh, 
uh, nuclear. The other 10% comes from other types of renewables, um, et cetera. Uh, but you know, we, we do think it's important that there be this dialogue. I will also tell you that I think a lot of people formed their opinions, and uh, you haven't really thought about uh, them. And there's a lot of new information that should help <coughs> people to reconsider their opinions about uh, nuclear. Excuse me. <coughs> you know, when I had the, uh, the real honor to run the Environmental Protection Agency for eight years of the Clinton administration, you know, we were extremely focused on conventional air pollution and setting new ozone and the first uh, soot standard and really helping to, you know, do what we could to help reduce all of the health effects associated with exposure to conventional um, air pollutants. And today, as I said, my focus is on climate change and on carbon pollution. And uh, I think nuclear and the existing nuclear fleet uh, plays a really important a role in, in that. So again, my honor uh, to be here and thank you all for coming and I will turn it over to Laura. Well, thank you, Carol. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I too would like to thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, but before I get into my little thing here, I wanna give you a little background of myself. 19 years ago, I never thought I'd be sitting right up here with this group or even talking or having the opportunity to speak on nuclear. My career started on the fossil side of the utility. With the old Toledo Edison, I worked between the Acme and Bay Shore plants, and then that transitioned over to Centurior Energy, as most of you may know, and then Centurior here around 2000 or so, um, merged with Ohio Edison and uh, formed First Energy. But 19 years ago, I was elected as the business manager of Local 245. The International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers has done a good job in educating everybody in all facets of energy, believe me. One of the things that we've had the opportunity to do is visit Yucca Mountain five times, uh, get to know and understand the nuclear field, and believe me, coming out of Fossil, that was quite a change. Okay, I couldn't understand why when you walked in the plant, people weren't dirty. And I guess it was the coal dust. But uh, in short, uh, I'll tell you, it's really been an honor to represent the physical side here and actually all of the employees. Uh, that's how we look at it. And in terms of employees, what we're looking at here, probably around 1,400 utility workers, nuclear workers within the state. I know here at this site, there's over 700. And that's on any given day. But the thing that's amazing about it to me is during refueling outages or um, times, I'll give you an example. Last year, uh, the company invested into the steam generator change out. Tremendous, a huge project. Uh, took in a lot of jobs. There were probably an additional 23 to 2,400 employees from the building trades, Northwest Ohio building trades, all the support and just all the different avenues of uh, employment that's involved in running in and out of here. Not to mention that the utility, on average, I believe they pay roughly around $40 million a year in wages. So when you take that out of the mix, those kind of wages, and I'm gonna defer the tax issue over to Jim, but I'm gonna ask him to explain that because I, I'm don't have those numbers down perfectly, but when you take that out of a community, uh, I don't have to tell you what it's done for the school systems, not only here, but when you go up to the other plant, uh, going from Ashtabula all the way back this way, everything, the economic impact along the whole lakeside is tremendous. So we're proud of all that very, very highly skilled workers, all of them that work here and that are in the field. And uh, I'm gonna admit something too, Carol. Mm -hmm. I had to learn to like nuclear <laughs> because I didn't understand it. And it, it was through the hard work of a lot of people to help me understand exactly what it was. So, Jim, if I could ask you about the tax base and... Well, sure, uh, the, I think... Uh, on a local basis, we this station is respond, or pays about twenty million dollars in, in taxes, and if you and that's all taxes. 
if you uh, look at on a local, state, and federal uh, perspective, the, the, this, this facility is responsible for about $160 million in taxes. So that's, that's a significant amount of support coming from this station. A lot of kids going to school. That's correct. That's correct. And, and you know, when we talk about that, about the financial side of things, uh, you know, when we look at the community involvement of all the employees in United Way, Salvation Army, and just reaching out to everything, Red Cross, it's tremendous. So uh, with that, I, I'd like to thank you again for the opportunity to be here. And uh, Jim, if I could pass it on to you. Well, thank you, Larry. Uh, I, too, would uh, like to say good morning and uh, thank Nuclear Matters for being here today to lead this very important discussion about an important source of power in our, in our business, uh, obviously, nu our nuclear stations. Now, Larry and I have known each other a number of years. I was, as it's already been said, I, was, I started my commercial nuclear career here at, uh, at Davis Bessey, so I've known Larry and worked with Larry for 20-something years, so appreciate that, Larry, all your support. First Energy is uh, is really the largest producer of elect, uh, you know elect, the largest producer of electricity in the state of Ohio. We have about 2.1 million customers, and those customers are served by our uh, distribution companies of Toledo Edison, Ohio Edison, and uh, Cleveland Electric Illuminating. We have seven other uh, distribution companies that provide service to the states of Pennsylvania, uh, West Virginia, Maryland. Uh, New Jersey and New York. From a generation standpoint, to give you a sense for the for the for what our fleet looks like, uh, we have uh, roughly 18,000 megawatts of electricity that we manage in our in our fleet. Uh, 14,000 megawatts of that 18 uh, is in in uh, unregulated or in the uh, unregulated markets, if you will. Uh, the is a diverse fleet. It's roughly about 57%. This is on a megawatt basis, on a capacity basis, about 57% coal, 23% nuclear, 11% hydro, a pump storage, and renewable, and about 9% gas. But on a total output basis, we put out about just over a third of our capacity uh, is from nuclear. So we're a little higher than the national average if you look at us on an output uh, basis. So I, I came to Davis Bessey in, in the late 1980s. Uh, this is where I started my nuclear career. I've always supported nuclear, as you can probably imagine. I got my senior reactor operator's license here at this station. I uh, worked in a, in a number of engineering and operation uh, leadership positions here at this plant. Then I uh, moved over to the Beaver Valley Station in Pennsylvania, and in a similar way, uh, functioned in a number of uh, operational and leader engineering uh, uh, assignments at that plant. And then, uh, fortunately, after that, I got the opportunity to become ultimately the chief nuclear officer for our fleet, and that would uh, now have responsibility for uh, the Perry Station, which is about 30 miles to the east of Cleveland. So that is our nuclear fleet. Now, I have responsibility for the entire fleet that I referenced. However, today, obviously, our focus is on that nuclear portion. And I give you that background for a reason, because I know personally that the men and women that manage these power plants do so with a, an unbelievable amount of commitment to being safe, reliable, and efficient. And that same commitment is, it can be found across the entire fleet of nuclear power plants across our, our country. Uh, we work very well th together as, a, as an industry through the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. We, we understand very well how each other conducts their business, and that safety is, is, is extremely important, and reliability and efficiency comes uh, once you've uh, achieved that safety. The, uh, those plants, as we've already said, are under, th are under threat, if you will, for a long-term continued operation. And for the most part, the threat is uh, flawed markets that we're, we're having to operate in. 40% of the nuclear plants in this country are in unregulated markets, which is where our nuclear stations are. And so in those markets, just to give you some examples, uh, retail products like demand response and energy efficiency are replacing 
baseload generation, and in particular, nuclear generation. Other plants, other baseload nuclear plants are, are threatened by uh, solar and, and wind, where government mandates has provided price guarantees to those uh, operators, if you will, that are above, frequently above market price. And so therefore they get dispatched ahead of you know, our traditional base load generation, which is generation that is 24-7, that is you, as you've heard from our other panel members. On the, uh, on, on the, on the carbon side, uh, Ms. Browner talked about the, uh, the importance of nuclear to carbon. 60% of the emission-free uh, generation in this country comes from nuclear power. However, as it's currently written, the carbon rule which we are working through with the, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency only allows the states to take credit for 6% of that capacity in meeting our emissions targets. So it's not fully uh, given us the value that we need, if you will, for, for, that, uh, for that amount of generation, for that emission-free generation. So with that, uh, those are just examples of some of the challenges, and we need to continue to make folks aware of those challenges. But in the state of Ohio, as a company, First Energy's kind of, we, we've uh, taken some action. And uh, in August of last year, we filed an electric security plan called Powering Ohio's Progress. As part of that plan was the, was the economic uh, um, stability pr uh, plan, which is essentially a purchase power agreement that would allow our utilities to take the output of two of our baseload generators, this plant, Davis Bessie and Samus Station, and then provide customers at a power at a cost. You take the cost of that generation minus the revenues that would be obtained from it, and the customers would receive either a credit or a charge, if you will, on their, on their monthly bill, depending on where the price is at that, at that time. Now, the purpose of this is to try to provide some stability in the marketplace and remove the volatility that we saw demonstrated most clearly last winter in the month of January. And then there were some other uh, opportunities, if you will, but that was probably the most dramatic. And it's also to, uh, maybe pass on, or it expected we'll be able to pass on savings because as, as we move forward over this 15 year period as, as we have uh, proposed, we expect electricity prices to continue to rise and as they do, there will be a savings and we estimate it to be about $2 billion to our customers uh, over that 15 year period. Now, what we're that's a, that's a program, we're, we're currently in, uh, in presenting that to the, the state, if you will, it's in, it's in uh, discussion, if you will, right now. Uh, but we have already, I believe in December, uh, had some 15 groups sign up to support this and have, have, we've established agreements with those groups and those groups represent residential, commercial, industrial, uh, low income customers, as well as uh, uh, organized, uh, organized labor and our schools, okay? And about 1,300 letters, if you will, have also been provided to the state that uh, support the idea or the concept of this uh, program that uh, this, the company has, has uh, put forward. So we'll continue to work through that, and we, we need to continue to make folks aware of the challenges that this uh, form of generation is, is under. Uh, for its long-term viability. And again, I wanna uh, thank uh, Nuclear Matters for being here today and, and helping us get through that discussion. Uh, and I, we're gonna move into a question and answer period and I wanna turn it over back to Carol Browner to get us going there. Well, thank you. Um, and um, thank you for that very uh, deep dive, if you will, on Ohio, very, very helpful. Um, let me just uh, say a few things about Nuclear Matter and then we're gonna open it up uh, to, to, to you all. Um, what we want to do is make sure that we have an informed, important discussion in this country. Um, as the senator noted, most of us don't think about our electricity until the lights don't come on. And then uh, we frantically look for the telephone to call and demand that our lights uh, be uh, restored. Um, you know, for, for most people, um, how electricity is made, where it comes from, et cetera, uh, is something they don't know anything about 
or if they do, their information is, is frequently out of date. I know I grew up in, in Miami, Florida. Uh, we had a company called Florida Power and Light. Uh, they made electricity, they transmitted it, they distributed it. Uh, today, they're next era, and they operate in 25 states. And you know, that's a story that you can tell about any number of, of companies. And so what we want to do is really make sure that people understand where our electricity is coming from, the challenges uh, that we face, the opportunities uh, that exist uh, to, to, to think about this and to think about it as we uh, address some really important public policy uh, questions, uh, pollution, uh, greenhouse gases, reliability. And so you know, today is, is part of our effort to continue to educate and hopefully begin that dialogue. Um, so I, this is very odd, but they've asked me to talk to you about social media. Um, I will be the first person to admit that I cannot get on a Facebook page, but uh, we do have a Facebook page. Um, if you're interested, it's a good, apparently, source of information. I'm sure you go to Facebook regularly. Almost once a year. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we do things like use Twitter, uh, which is another way to get information. Um, but actually, the Facebook page uh, is quite thoughtful and does have a fair amount of important information. All the slides you saw today um, are um, available there. And so again, uh, thank you all for, for taking the time. For those of you who know this uh, business inside out, thank you uh, for coming. And for those of you who are looking uh, to learn, uh, please ask us questions, and hopefully we can answer them. Well, thank you. Um, maybe I can start us off by a couple of questions and maybe uh, turn it over to the crowd here. Uh, Senator, I, maybe I could direct this question. As you know, we're obviously the center of a big shale revolution, a lot of, lot of gas coming on. Matter of fact, uh, we're approaching, I think I read, almost 40% of the natural gas produced between our Utica and Marcellus shale regions. So obvious question would be, why not gas? Uh, why, why should we continue to be interested in nuclear when we have such a diverse uh, commodity here in our state, which is obviously helpful to our economy as well? Well, first off, we think gas is a great opportunity for our nation. Obviously, the, the ability to be free of imports is very important to us in uh, fossil fuels, especially in the New England region, uh, where we're talking more about oil and gas, but it's a big issue. Uh, I think the, the essence of this comes down to the fact that two things. One, just from an a attitude of national security, you do not want to put all your eggs in one basket. That would be dangerous. I mean, we don't know what's going to happen to gas 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now. We do know, and this is the second point, that we have a nu nuclear fleet that exists, that's producing power, and that these plants, which may be subject to premature closure, could continue to function for 10, 15, 30 years. And it would be foolish to take them offline and turn entirely to one other form of energy and expect that we would have stability over a long period of time because we never will. You just don't, that just doesn't happen. Things change. Price of gas changes. Who knows what else will be, come along? So a, a diverse energy supply is absolutely critical to a vibrant, strong, industrialized economy like we have. And nuclear is a key part of that. Now, we're not talking about new plants here. We're talking about existing plants. They already exist. Why would you take them offline before the useful life is up? I mean, you know, I describe it as cutting off your nose to spite your face almost in, in energy policy to do that. Um, this one, I, let me add to that. I mean, you know, taking, as I said before, taking existing nuclear off while you're trying to reduce carbon pollution is just going to make the job, you know, that much impossible, much harder. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you can't possibly hit. Not the Ohio standards if you're going to have 90% of your non-carbon emission going offline or some percent, high percentage. It'd be very hard. So, so to that point, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Do you want to add? No, no, no. Uh, Carolyn and actually Jim mentioned this as well. Uh, I found it interesting that really nuclear doesn't get credit for that I, reduction. Let me explain and, that. And I yeah. think that would be helpful. Yeah, and, and Jim Why was good to, to bring it up. Well, possibly? first of all, okay, now we're going to have to just spend a moment on the nuances of EPA regulations, but it's worth understanding. EPA hasn't made a decision. They have put a proposal out. So the first step, Congress has to pass a law, then EPA has to implement the law. And the first step in implementation is to say to people, here's the science, here's what we're thinking, tell us what you think. And so that's where we are right now. So what EPA has basically 
set out to do, um, I should back up because something interesting happened in this particular instance that is rare at EPA. Congress passed a law. The Supreme Court said to EPA, if you think climate change, carbon pollution, endangers the public health and welfare of the United States, you must regulate carbon emissions. So that was an unusual having the Supreme Court step in. That's uh, courtesy of the state of Massachusetts who sued EPA uh, under Bush too, and won in the Supreme Court. EPA then made that scientific conclusion based on a wealth of information, which then meant they had to start the process of regulating carbon. So we've been on this path now for six years. The first regulations were about cars and trucks, and it was a combination of the emissions, the carbon emissions associated with cars, and fuel efficiency. And so the good news is, um, if you buy a new car this year, it is more fuel efficient than last year. And in model year 20, I think it's 2025, the corporate average fuel standard is 54.5 miles per gallon. So uh, we will have far more efficient cars and cleaner cars as this program rolls out. And I was very uh, honored to be a part of the team that put the program together, uh, working with the unions, uh, working with the car companies, uh, working with the environmental community. We were able to find an agreement that met sort of everybody's, as I said, nobody got precisely what they wanted, but they got what they needed, and uh, that, that's always a good outcome for regulation. So in, what's happening right now is EPA has said, we will set, we will propose targets for each state, reduction targets of carbon. They're not free to pick any number. They had to use a formula, and they had to make assumptions in the formula based on real world practices. So they assumed that coal plants that are operating, um, depending on where you go in the country, they're operating at various rates of efficiency, but they assumed they could all operate a little bit more efficiently. The same thing with natural gas plants. They're not operating at 100 or 90% efficiency. So they assumed that if you have natural gas plants in your state, they could become more efficient. They assumed that you could have more energy efficiency, that you could use demand response, you could use household energy efficiency, business energy efficiency. And the final thing they assumed was that there will continue to be a growth in carbon-free energy. And so the 6% that you talked about is they assumed that not all nuclear baseload would stay online, but that at least a certain percentage of it. So that's how they then derive a target for a state, a proposed target. No state has to do any of those things to meet the target. They're free to do whatever they want. They get to write a plan. Some states may decide to keep more nuclear online. Some states may decide to do more energy efficiency. But we believe, from our perspective at Nuclear Matters, is it just makes common sense to keep the current nuclear online because it is such an important part of reliability. It's in, because of the base load, but also because of the, the carbon reductions. But you know, the, as the senator said, that's part of the national debate we're having right now, which is what is the most common sense, cost-effective way to make sure we meet all of the consumer demands associated with electricity while continuing to reduce uh, pollution. And in some instances, that may be a mix of nuclear, some renewables. I personally think renewables are going to be a pretty important part, but I don't think this is a situation where you have to choose. You know, we, we need it all, and so uh, you know, not putting all your eggs in one basket is a, a pretty important way uh, to think about our energy future. You know, if we had been sitting here three years ago, shoot, if we had been sitting here nine months ago, and I had said to you, don't worry, a gallon of gas is going to cost, I don't know, what is it costing here, $2? You would have thought I'd lost my mind, right? You would have been like, she's crazy. What does she know? Uh, what do any of us know? I mean, what we do know is energy is now a dynamic market, whether it be the fuels we use for our cars and trucks, whether it be how we make electricity. And so continuing to look at what we've already done, what's available, and then how we build on that is pretty important.